hello again, and welcome back to our last episode of Phase 1 on the Ostrich Technique podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Ananth. And I'm your other host, Chris. So, Chris, it's all sort of been leading up to this now, where we're finally on the Avengers episode. I know I was definitely looking forward to this one. I don't know about you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is the culmination of the first phase. Obviously, the biggest Marvel, potentially biggest superhero film, you know, up to date in terms of 2012 when it released. Yeah. So, yeah, I was definitely excited to to watch this one again. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I feel like before we even jump into the movie, I feel like we need to also just talk about the lead up to this movie, because, you know, I know for me, this was like one of maybe the most hyped movies, I think, up till that point. I mean, it came out like end of ninth grade for us when we were. Yeah, when we were in ninth grade, basically. So like May of 2012. Mm -hmm. I remember I I pre-booked tickets for this, like in IMAX, went to go see it. And man, I mean, I remember just the sort of lead up to this. It was just insane in terms of online and stuff. I know this was really when like the big online chatter for Marvel movies in particular really started up. I don't know if it was the same yeah. for you. I mean, I didn't, you definitely had the, the bigger, more, you know, Avengers level experience for this movie than me. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, this, this movie was kind of, you know, a big deal. Um, yeah. Maybe a little bit more so to you, you know, just based upon our conversations about it. But I mean, yeah, I mean, you had to know, like, like you were under a rock. You'd still would probably know this was going on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, lived up to the hype, in my opinion. Oh, for sure. For sure it did. I mean, this was this is the kind of I mean, I think the Avengers movies in particular were always sort of these zeitgeist moments, sort of like I think. Do you think it's sort of a stretch to say kind of like our generation Star Wars where like sort of everyone and their mom sort of knew about it? Like, I mean, the fact that my mom knew that Avengers movies were coming out, I think, is a pretty clear indication that like everyone yeah. knew about these movies. Yeah. So and yeah, of course, sure. it truly did live up to the hype. I mean, I still have my original Avengers one poster somewhere in some box somewhere at my parents place. So definitely. I just adored this movie, so I was really excited to go back to this one. But uh, yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, it's a good one. It definitely is. Yeah. Um, but we're here to discuss now, so I guess we can just, you know, jump right into it. So, Chris, do you want to give us the intro for Avengers? Sure. So, The Avengers, released in 2012, it's about Earth's mightiest heroes who must come together and learn to fight as a team. If they're going to stop the mischievous Loki and his alien army from enslaving humanity. It is directed by Joss Whedon, and it has a true ensemble cast starring Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, Scarlett Johansson, Chris Hemsworth, Mark Ruffalo, Jeremy Renner, Tom Hiddleston, and Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, well, thanks for that, Chris. So, you know... I know you and I definitely have very hot thoughts about this movie before we, you know, came in to watch it. But I think compared to that, how did the rewatch hold up for you? How did the movie hold up for you? I think it held up. It's still a very, very good movie. Mm -hmm. My overall critique, or I guess not my overall critique, the biggest critique of this movie has always been it moves too slow in the beginning to kind of get rolling. And that's still the case for me on this rewatch, but it wasn't as slow as I remember. And I think definitely of us kind of watching these movies sequentially, uh, at least in the order that they've been released has kind of helped because it kind of helps me remember where the characters have been at and why it kind of takes some time for you to really get to know each of them individually before they come together. And it's kind of necessary, yeah. but mm -hmm. overall it does hold up. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I think it definitely held up for me. I remember one of the big critiques when the movie came out, and I think I still hear this online when people talk about the first one, is that first two acts are sort of a bit slow, which I definitely get. It's not, you know, a lot of ton of action going on in those bits. I mean, there's really only a handful of things that go on. Like there's the scene in Germany. There's a bit of action there. There's obviously the helicarrier fight. And then obviously the blowout is the third act when they're Battle of New York, basically. I definitely get where they're coming from. And I think for me, 
the character moments actually resonated even better this time around because that's really what the first two acts focus on and i think with the context of the original movie or you know the entire infinity saga now to look back on and sort of the whole arcs of cap and tony in particular this movie really slots in well and is i think works well for this one in particular and obviously when we get to avengers 2 we can talk about it and how it contrasts is that this one focuses on telling its own story and it's not really focused on like you know sort of the broader grand design of the mcu because i mean this movie was a complete gamble on marvel's part like they didn't know that this was going to be as successful as it was they were Mm -hmm. very much sort of putting all their chips on the table here and hoping that it was going to be you know as resonant as they were hoping to make it and of course it was wildly successful first mcu movie to make a billion dollars and whatnot so worked but it was really i i think the fact that they focused on the characters in particular for me really I it worked really well for me. And if anything, it made the third act more satisfying just because you're so invested in everyone trying to, you know, get their comeuppance back on Loki and, you know, you want to see them kick ass and do a great and just look super cool doing it. So yeah, I think this I mean, this movie is in my mind, it's a near flawless movie. I mean, you know, for a long time this movie was ranked at maybe my favorite overall mcu movie in terms of experience and you know the actual movie itself so uh yeah very high expectations going in and i think it certainly lived up to them i was not disappointed on the rewatch great yeah so i guess with that we can you know just jump right into the first act so the first act obviously you know like i was teasing out a lot of setup here in the first act you know i think the first act, what it does well, uh, again, kind of with the original set of MCU movies, even up to like phase two or three, they really do a good job of table setting for people that haven't seen the other Avengers movies. There were the other, you know, MCU movies. There wasn't an expectation that everyone saw it. Obviously, I think there's a lot more depth you get from having seen Iron Man 1 and 2, Cap, Thor, all of those movies. But this movie really does a good job sort of setting up the table for everyone here. So, because I think they expected casual fans coming in, not having seen anything else, maybe Iron Man at most, and, you know, sort of hitting the ground running. And they do a really good job sort of setting up everyone's characters here and there and giving the information that you need to sort of get into the movie. I don't know. I don't know if you had any different thoughts on that. No, I think you explained it pretty well. It does a good job of setting the table, especially for casual fans. So. Yeah, I agree with all your points. Yeah, I mean, what do you think? I guess, obviously, it takes a little bit to get to our core Avengers characters. We start off the whole movie at the S.H.I.E.L.D. compound. We get a little bit about the Tesseract and stuff. What did you think of that whole opening sequence with, you know, at S.H.I.E.L.D., sort of this underground base that they had? I think it was in, like, New Mexico or something? I forget where yeah. it was. Yeah, New Mexico. Yeah, what did you think of that opening? I thought it was a good opening. You know, it showed the stakes right away. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it showed them where they were with the Tesseract and like, you know, how powerful that thing is and how unruly, you know, how it basically it's kind of sentient in a yeah. way. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was a good opening. You know, it set the stage for, you know, Loki's sort of mind control and his just his capabilities. Uh, I thought it was you know, it was an action sequence as well. So yeah, yeah, that that's true. Exciting. Yeah, no, it definitely was an action sequence. I, I think, I mean, like there's there's almost a bit of restraint with the movie sort of holding us back from seeing all of the sort of core characters right away. So mm-hmm. you go into an Avengers movie thinking that oh, we're going to see like you know maybe Tony Stark right away because he is the arguably the most popular character amongst all six of them. So. You thought we'd maybe start off with that right away. No, it's sort of setting the table again, reminding everyone what the Tesseract is. We get introduced to some of the key characters like Eric Selvig and Fury again, of course. We get our first introduction to Maria Hill. We've never seen her before in the MCU, played by Colby Smulders, and she does a great job. We, I, Clark Gregg also does show up in the, the scene as well. So... We get sort of all of the little chips here. And then, of course, Loki's introduction. We get Hawkeye's introduction. And yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a good scene. It sets up, 
it gives you the information that you need. We get a sense that, you know, Tesseract is powerful. Loki's powerful. He gets his little moment to show that he is actually formidable and that S.H.I.E.L.D. is worried about him having the Tesseract. And, you know, we also get little glimpses of, like, you know, S.H.I.E.L.D. has other stuff going on. They mention Phase 2 a couple yeah. of times with the Tesseract, and you sort of don't know what it is, obviously, till we find out what it is later on. But, you know, it, it was a good setup overall. I, I agree. I think it, it does what it has to. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It's not too long. And, of course, you know, I think Whedon and Faye and the powers and Marvel realized that people, they we got as much as we needed and gave us sort of the breather before we got to all of our sort of heroes coming together. So yeah, of course, after that, then there's the titles and then we get sort of each of our individual character intros. So mm -hmm. what did you think of those character intros? Obviously, we start off with Natasha, then we get her getting Banner and Hulk. Then after that, we get a little bit of, was it Hemsworth? I think we no, we don't get Hemsworth. We get Captain America's intro after that, and then was it Iron Man and then Cap? It's Iron Man then Cap. Iron Man then Cap. Okay, we get Iron Man then Cap, and of course Thor comes in much later. So, what did you yep. think of the little intros that we got for the characters? Then I think they were good. Like you said, no. it's kind of this restraint, and they don't. You know, it makes you want to see more, which is you know good. And I think that it was good, these little intros, and they slowly interweave their stories together. So I thought it was a really smart way to do it in a really, really tasteful way. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you get, again, you really get sort of the key information that you need for each character as they're being introduced. You get that, you know, I think it was an interesting choice to put Romanov in Russia, just because that wasn't really how she was introduced in Iron Man 2. But I think it really gives you a sense that, look, she is a spy. She has sort of this sort of uh, allure and appeal to her. But at the same time, she is a badass. And I think that they did a good job with her. Obviously, the Banner intro was very interesting because this is also the first time that Mark Ruffalo is playing the Hulk, mm -hmm. Bruce Banner in this case. And it was an interesting introduction to him. I think that they really sort of, I think that sort of conversation in particular that dance back and forth between him and Romanov was, I thought, particularly interesting. And I like the sort of banter that we got there. And obviously that leads into the, you know, the, the <laughs> yeah. romance in Avengers yeah. 2. Yeah, um, but we can forget about that, though. Yeah, I mean, we'll get to that when we get to it. But was it was an interesting introduction, I thought. I think I thought they yeah. did a good job. You know, I got to say personally, as as an Indian, I didn't love that they made India look like a total slum that he's staying in. But you know, I get for the purpose of the story, they were trying to show that he was in a very chaotic environment. You know, India is a chaotic environment. So I get that point. Yeah, of course, Iron Man's intro is very much, you know, the same sort of big, bold thing that we expect from Tony, where he's setting up the arc reactors for Stark Tower. We get the giant Stark Tower intro and... Of course, Cap's intro is, is good, too, where we sort of we actually get a little bit of flashbacks from his movie, which I thought actually works well from. Yeah. Yeah. But I agree. They were all really good intros there. Do you have a favorite amongst them, amongst the character intros? Any any particular one that you liked? Uh, I never actually really thought about it. I mean, I think like your to your point, I think the banner intro is pretty cool, like with Natasha. I'd say that one. There's like a lot of tension there. Kind of put you on your edge because you know this guy turns can turn into the Hulk at any moment. And it's kind of sort of this mental game between Natasha and Bruce. Seeing like basically who's going to crack first. Like, uh, you know, Natasha is like, okay, yeah, I'm here alone. And then, you know, Bruce ends up cracking her that, hey, we've got the perimeter surrounded. So I thought that whole sort of dynamic was really cool. I thought that was probably my favorite intro. No, I, I think I agree. I think the banner intro is definitely my favorite. And I think a common theme amongst this movie for me, and I think you agree with this as well, is that this is maybe the best handling of the Hulk, I think, out of any MCU movie, period. Even more than his own movie in The Incredible oh, Hulk. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they really tiptoe between the sort of... I think capture all the aspects really well. And I think Joss, I mean, he did a good job in Avengers too as well, but he really gets that sort of balance of, you know, Banner being the science bro, him trying to balance the Hulk side of him. And of course, when the Hulk is out, there's just, 
I mean, the ferocity of Hulk is there, of course, but the fact that there is genuine fear amongst everyone and particular, and I think Natasha was a really good sort of conduit for that fear to show that fear because she is genuinely petrified of the Hulk. And you get that, especially later on in the, in the movie as well, when he hulks out for the first time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say you have a least favorite character intro amongst them? No, I don't think so. I guess Thor. I mean, I don't know. Thor. Thor's intro is also like his intro is a fight, essentially. Yeah, but, his intro is a fight. I mean, him landing on the roof of the the Quinjet, I guess. But I don't know. I don't really yeah. have a you know a least favorite. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna cheat and say Hawkeye's intro was my least favorite, even though it's like right at the beginning. Because we still don't yeah. know a ton about Hawkeye. We just sort of get that one bit of him in Thor 1. And then we just sort of mm-hmm. see him, what he's, the hawk is up in his nest or something is what Selvig says, something along those lines. Yeah. So, not a, I wouldn't say great intro for Hawkeye. Like, I mean, again, amongst the, uh, other than the comic book diehards and like the core fans who are going to go see this movie, I don't think the general audience sort of knew who Hawkeye was until... He really starts doing his bow and arrow stuff. Yeah. So, uh, and the bow and arrow stuff really only comes later on, I think, when they're actually attacking the Quinjet. So, you don't really get a sense of Hawkeye and his intro. So, I think that for me is the, my least favorite. But I think Thor uh, makes sense to sort of just abrupt. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair. That's a fair point. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, the, the intros are all there. Uh, and of course, after all the intros is when you know you start sort of start getting the team to all assemble together. You get obviously Natasha is the one to bring in Bruce, and then once Cap is called in from Fury, Coulson is the one that brings in Cap. And I got to mention also about Cap's intro. I thought it was interesting that Fury is just lying hardcore about the goal with the Tesseract, about the mm-hmm. you know sustainable energy and all that stuff. Because we yeah. keep again we keep hearing about Phase Two. And, of course, later on, we find out it's about them trying to make weapons. So it's just really interesting to see him, like, definitely just straight up lying to Cap. And obviously, Cap does not take that well when he nope. finds out later on. But, um, yeah, I mean, in this one, of course, Coulson and Cap get a little bit of in- interaction with one another. And, and it's, it's kind of funny, you know, like, you know, yeah. I'll, watch you, I'll watch you when you sleep, you know, or when, <laughs> when you were asleep. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The whole no, I mean, Coulson. Interaction. Yeah, no, I mean, Coulson does, I mentioned this later on, of course, with the, I mean, of of course, spoiler alert, Coulson dies in this movie, but the fact that we care about Coulson's death in this movie, when, I mean, quite frankly, we haven't seen a ton of him in the other movies, like, we really get, like, just brief glimpses of him just being, like, an agent, I think it really goes to show the work that they did to humanize his character in this movie in particular, and they mm-hmm. really did a good job with that. I, and I think it starts with this scene with him interacting with Cap and giving him like that sort of human moment of like, oh, I'm really excited. It, you could tell that he's genuinely excited to be standing and hanging out with Captain America. Mm-hmm. Clark Gregg does such a great job at playing that. And of course, in real life, you can tell that he's also a fan of the stuff. So I think it carries through for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we also, and he's not the only Avenger that we interact, He we see him interact with. Of course, we saw him interact with Tony again when he gives Tony the files on the core yep. Avengers. And I think it's cool that we, when Tony, you know, pulls up all the files, we get to see all of the little bits of, from everyone's movies. We get to see Thor and Hulk and whatnot. Yep. But uh, yeah, I mean, really good intros. Of course, I think Coulson has his moment too. I mean, even with the forgot Coulson's moment also when he calls Natasha where he's just sort of waiting on the phone I mean this yeah. movie just I think that's another thing with this movie in particular it just does humor really really well it just Joss is sort of able to balance the the humor and the seriousness and the action it's just really well done in terms of balancing tones just through and through yeah it does do a good job of that I agree yeah yeah I mean I think it's also interesting, one thing that I noticed in particular, and I don't know if you caught this as well, was that all of the characters on the good side so far, they have like these really clear sort of colors that they set out for them. So like when you are looking at a banner, he's wearing a purple shirt. Natasha's yep. wearing a red shirt. Cap has that old leather jacket of his. Mm. And it's sort of like those sort of clear, I, 
icon iconic sort of colors that are associated with those characters and i thought that that was sort of an interesting choice and i think it works very well honestly i don't know if you caught that yeah i mean yeah for banner i think it's very clear with the purple yeah um same thing with natasha yeah come to think of it tony is wearing like you know black a decent amount whether it's sports coat or you know the black sabbath shirt Clint mm-hmm, is, mm-hmm. you know, just kind of in his, his uniform the entire time. But yeah, um, yeah, I think it does work really well. It very subtly, you know, has you associate a color with the character and yep. helps kind of, you know, stick in your mind. So for sure, it, really, really good choices from a uh, costume perspective. For sure. Uh, I, I will say, though, good choices from a costuming perspective, except for when we get caps actual Avengers uh, costume, yeah. which blame Coulson, uh, um, yeah, the, the tight, the blue tight spandex suit, which I know got a lot of flack in this one in particular. I, I know they tried to stick very close to sort of the comic book suit, which I respect and I didn't work in this one, which I think also I respect Marvel for realizing that it didn't work. And they sort of made it a joke as they yep. went on in the movies. So uh, yeah, I mean, it worked really well, I think for me. Obviously, after all of that stuff, we get, we we hear that, you know, Loki is infiltrating Germany, and then that's when we get the little bit of them suiting up, and that's, I mean, when we see Cap's, you know, suit for the first time, when he's about to go and fly into Germany and try and fight Loki. So, what do you think of that whole scene with Loki infiltrating the German, you know, I forget where they were in Germany, but they were trying to get that that dude's eye and they were trying to get that one sort of compound to sort of stabilize the Tesseract reaction and, or something along those lines. Basically looking for some sort of MacGuffin, right? Yeah, I thought it was a good scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit of like a heist at the beginning, yeah. like you're saying, they need to get the Iridium, not to be confused with... Uh... The tritium, tritium, the precious um, tritium. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was like a little bit of a heist feel. And then, um, you know, then you kind of see Loki's king complex kind of take over, like, you know, Neil, which I thought was a really cool scene. And yeah. then obviously, you know, we that leads to the fight with Captain America. Uh, so mm-hmm. overall, I think it was a really, really cool sequence. And, of you know, it's just fittingly that Cap is the first one there, you know, being the World War II veteran um, going yeah. to Germany. So, yeah, no, I think a good setup overall. I mean, what do you think of the way that Loki speaks in this one? He speaks in sort of that sort of old English style. Yeah. Uh, kind of like how they did from Thor 1. Obviously, that changes as the movies go on. But did you have a preference for them speaking the sort of like more old regal style versus how they, I guess, speak in the more Taika modern English style? At, at the, I like that they talk like this regal style uh, as it is in this point in the MCU. <laughs> uh, just feels like it should be that way. Also, like, you know, they he wants to be a king. Yeah, of course. Um, So it makes sense, whereas later down the line, he kind of realizes that he won't make it. So, or not, he won't be a king, so... That's why originally where they were very modern contracts. I was just curious because I know that that was something that stuck out to me, especially coming from, you know, Loki season two, where Loki's just talking like a normal guy in this. So uh, I guess, you know, timeline wise, chronologically, it's not too far off. Like, I mean, his his character in Loki season two isn't too far off from the Avengers, obviously, because of, you know, uh, multiverse mumbo jumbo. But it's interesting how he just talks more like a normal person in the that show. And obviously that being so close to when we watched the Avengers, it was just sort of it playing on my mind, which is why I was curious about it. But yeah, I mean, and again, mentioned the fight, which was the between Cap and Loki. And another thing that stuck out to me with the Cap fight was just how different Cap's fighting style is in the Avengers movie in particular. And I remember that it's more of like the sort of acrobatic and like a boxer style versus as you go into like Cap 2 and then from there on, I think the Russo sort of really change Cap's fighting language to be more MMA and quicker. And I don't know if you had any thoughts about Cap's fighting style in this one. Yeah, actually something I didn't really actively think about, but now that you mentioned it, I kind of agree. He's much more, like you said, MMA style, much more acrobatic with, you know, Winter Soldier on. But I think it does make sense that it's very much more like a boxer style in, in 
Captain America First Avenger as well as in The Avengers, given that, you know, probably in his time in the 1940s, you know, boxing is really the main form of fighting and he kind of just just got defrosted um, right right before the avengers so yeah um, that kind of makes sense in tracks so yeah. it's a good point that you bring up no definitely i mean i think makes sense contextually i mean i definitely prefer the, his fighting style as it goes later on i think it suits him better and honestly i think it looks a little bit more comic booky and you know fits the style of a what I would think of of Captain America in our world in I guess the twenty the late twenty tens and into twenty I mean yeah late twenty tens because it ended in twenty nineteen but yeah I think that that you know I think it works in this movie and I think his style later on works in later movies as well mm -hmm. uh, but yeah of course uh, on top of the you know fight that Loki and Cap have which I mean I think you and I agree it's think decent obviously some of the later action scenes are better i think the more notable bit here is that tony and cap meet for the first time as well here correct um, obviously tony's intro with the acdc shoot to thrill and also not only that but cap also gets you know i think maybe the most clear musical cues from his original movie mm -hmm. uh, obviously part of that being from alan silvestri doing cap one and now also doing the avengers which i think helps he had to plug his sort own of, score. Yeah, you know, it's true. It, I mean, it works, though. I think it does work because, like, you can very clearly tell when it's, like, Cap's music, even and the sort of, I mean, when we talk later about the whole, like, Quinjet blowing up stuff, or not the Quinjet, sorry, the Helicarrier blowing up, you hear that music where he's, like, sort of jumping around that do 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 that, that sort of theme, so... Yeah, but what do you think of Tony and Cap's meetup? Did you feel like it was a sort of a good, quick... Did you want it to them to have more interaction, or I guess you're fine with how they sort of played it out with them interacting later on? Yeah, I think it's fine the way they played out later on. It's not the grand sort of introduction to each other that um probably would have expected, you know, at least now knowing how things turn out with those two later on in the MCU and how basically they're two out of the big three. That's kind right. of how their introduction was. It was, you know, it's very underwhelming looking, you know, retrospectively, but it didn't bug me. Like, interacted mm -hmm. plenty later on. So I was, oh, I mean, absolutely. personally, I was fine with it. Yeah. No, if anything, I think it actually speaks to sort of Tony. I mean, I guess the, I guess the, the version of an Irish goodbye, but for like a hello, where it's like just sort of very quick and like very yeah. matter of fact, doesn't really weigh on it too much which I mm -hmm. kind of like that. So, yeah, I thought it was a good interaction. Of course, then they take in Loki, and while they're flying in the Quinjet, we see uh, whatever the lightning, and I really like the line that Tom Hiddleston and Loki used there, where, are you particularly afraid of lightning? And he's like, I, I'm not particularly fond of what comes after. And of yep. course, right after that is where Thor comes in and just sort of takes Loki, and then we get the Thor and Iron Man fight, which I remember that was like the big thing that they were sort of putting in the promos before the movie yes. came out. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was a great fight. I don't know. I mean, before the fight also, I think the conversation first between Thor and Loki was also great. I think part of why I like that is, again, it's a focus on a character on the characters in particular. And it also shows Thor's evolution, like from Thor one and how he's focused more about, and I mean, he says how the throne would suit Loki ill, and he's sort of, you can see the learnings that he's had from Thor 1 till now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think it's that whole interaction between them shows, you know, Loki's evolution too, like him explaining, you know, I've seen worlds that, you know, that you've never known. He's become more than what Thor knows of Loki. And, you know, also we see Thor just saying, like, you know, come home. Like, he, he misses his brother still, even though his brother tried to, you know, usurp the throne and everything. But mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I think it really, they play the emotion. I mean, Tom, uh, not Tom Hiddleston, Chris Hemsworth plays the emotions really well in particular, where you get that sense of, like, you know, he really does want his brother to, you know, come back. He wants, he does love his brother even though he realizes his brother is a troublemaker and, uh -huh. you know, there, there's definitely a complex relationship he has with 
yeah. Loki. Just I think as he has a complex relationship with almost everyone in his family, except for maybe his mother. I think his mother is like very sort of pure, straightforward. He loves yeah. his mother. His mother loves him. But yeah. other than that, complex relationship, which I think this conversation captures quite well. But of course, conversations cut short because we get the Thor Iron Man fight. And I mean, it's a great fight. It's a, I mean, it's a good fight. <laughs> it's a good fight. You see that they're just both really formidable in their own ways. And I really do like also the, I think the bit that I like is the lightning going on his, like powering him up and him going to 400% capacity. How about um, that? How about that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're just filled with these like really little great moments, all of these little fights. And I mean, you really could feel the attention to detail in, I think, every aspect of this movie. And the fight is just an example of that. Yeah, no, I agree. I really liked that fight. And I agree with mm-hmm. all the points that, you know, you've made. I'm honestly a little surprised Tony held up as well as he did against Thor. Yep. Given that Thor is mm-hmm. basically like this god. and uh, But yeah, I mean, it was a good fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I think also part of that is Thor probably underestimated Iron Man. I don't think he expected much from how much he was going to fight or how much he'd be able to hold his own. Though... I think timeline wise also, I mean, he has been Iron Man in universe for at least three and a half, four years at this point. So mm-hmm. it's not like he's he's still a noob at this. He he's been doing this for some time, yeah. clearly. He knows what he's doing. So I think his prowess, his fighting prowess definitely speaks to that, or his ability within the suit, rather. And this, then of course, yeah. you know, they're not alone. Cap also joins the fight for a little bit. I mean, just for he he tries to break it up and then Thor, you know, puts the hammer down on the shield <laughs> with that, you know, whatever the the sonic blast or sonic whatever that blast, happened. Yeah. But what I think, I, I, it's a cool moment, but I think what's really cool about that is how they bring it back in later movies in particular. Obviously, Avengers 2 and then Endgame in particular, they, they bring back yeah. that sort of sonic blast and they use it in interesting ways, which I like. But yeah, I mean, this is really the meeting of the big three, I guess, Marvel's version of the Trinity almost yeah. of Cap, Tony, and Iron Man. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think just a great sort of introduction to the three of them, their sort of interactions, and it really sets the stage for the sort of tumultuous relationships that the three of them have with one another. I mean, definitely a lot more focus between Tony and Cap for sure. I mean, Thor, I mean, in Avengers 2 at least, Thor does have a little beef with Tony, but. Oh, yeah. Um, I never, correct me if I'm wrong, but at least in any of these movies, Thor never, Thor and Steve never have any sort of, you know, argument with each other or, or quarrel, you know? No, no, I don't think so. I think Thor has, I mean, especially as their relationship develops, I mean, I think more clearly you see in Avengers 2, but there's definitely a level of respect that I think Thor yeah. has for Steve. For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think sort of like the warrior soldier sort of mentality, I think they're they're sort of one and the same. And, you know, Steve is very much about like sort of honor and yes. um, that that he stands for very sort of righteous purposes. And I think Thor respects okay. that very much. And he and it's not like he doesn't act in any different way. He's very sort of consistent in his actions as well. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think a lot of the tumult more is, you know, Thor and Tony. And then, of course, Tony and Steve, for yeah, sure. To- Tony's the common ground here. <laughs> I'm, you know, he he he's a little bit of a firecracker, so you know. Yes, yeah, very much. But yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, that's really the end of Act One. I mean, just I think a really solid Act One uh, sets the stage for a lot of things. And you know, I mean, people wouldn't have liked it as much if Act One was boring. So they, I think, they definitely laid a lot of the right groundwork in Act One for sure. Um, I think Act Two is, you know, as we get into it, is where people a lot more of the sort of gripes come in with for Mm -hmm. this movie in particular where people are like oh it's a little bit slower it's not as exciting because it's just more people talking but of course we'll you know get to act two but i guess any final thoughts on act one chris well i guess just the end there you know you kind of see like loki like looking on very excited to see them fighting yeah Uh, yeah and you know they they do and we'll get to this but they do reference it later on and literally soon after like it was it was kind of too easy like why like literally loki could have escaped but obviously we know it's part of his plan to get captured right right but like yeah like you said overall solid act like i mentioned earlier it's my biggest gripe of 
movie starting off too slow wasn't as much of an issue to me mm-hmm. this time around. So like, and there's very good action. Something I did notice though was there a lot of like the close-ups, like these guys are sweating. <laughs> like, oh yeah. Like, uh, I think it's Hawkeye later on, but you know, a close-up of him, he's like, you could see on, or maybe it's like literally in the beginning where they're at the Tesseract. He's got some sweat on his brow. Like when Loki enters, he's sweating. Like, I don't know if that was like on purpose where like a lot of these characters are sweating or if mm-hmm. or it's just like really hot on set or, you know, the costumes, but that's just something that really popped out. me want to, you know, rewatch. That's interesting. You know, I did, <laughs> I did notice the sweat more on Hawkeye in particular after he's mind controlled, like sort mm-hmm. of like a clammy, sweaty yeah. appearance. I didn't notice it as much in the beginning with the Tesseract, but like or in that scene where they're at the shield base in particular, but it's a good, it's an interesting observation. It probably is just, you know, a lot of the filming was done in Atlanta and Atlanta is hot, very hot. So, you know, I don't blame them. I mean, a lot of their, I know the superhero suits that they wear, they have to wear like that sort of water um, vest underneath underneath. or something. So they get like cold water pumped through them. So it's, 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 not easy being a superhero for sure. But yeah, I mean, it, one other thing I guess I didn't mention, I guess this, I mean, this applies to the entire movie is the aspect ratio. Cause this is really the only movie that is shot in this sort of taller and it's the entire movie is shot like this. It's in a 1.85 to one aspect ratio. It's almost sort of the IMAX expanded ratio that they started using in later movies. But did you have any thoughts on that? I know the cinematographer, his idea was basically he wanted a taller frame to fit all of these larger than life characters. Basically, it was his that's rationale. That's an interesting choice. I mean, I, I mean, I didn't you know, personally really take note of it, but that sort of choice to do that for that reason sounds pretty makes sense to me. You know, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean. You know, I like that they use that taller aspect ratio. I mean, you know, I guess uh, outside of the MCU and in general, I am a fan of films that are shot in IMAX, and I like that sort of taller mm-hmm. aspect ratio in particular. Uh, and I think especially for like superhero movies, I guess not not even Marvel related, but for the Snyder cut of Justice League in particular, that was in a four by three aspect ratio. That's almost a square. So like you really get these sort of tall pictures of you know, all of the Justice League with when it's sort of framed in that manner. And I think that that's, I thought that it's really interesting choice to film it that way. And I'm curious that Marvel has not gone back to that sort of aspect ratio again for the home releases of the movie in particular. I know that now, you know, on Disney Plus, they have the IMAX expanded ratio, which is, you know, a 1.9 by one sort of aspect ratio. But Interesting that they decided to release this. This, I mean, this is the one that like everyone saw like on DVD. There's no like widescreen version of Avengers. This is like the mm. version. So, yeah, I mean, it was just an interesting observation. I thought I'd just ask about it because it's something that I always remember being particularly unique about the Avengers. But yeah, I mean, that is Act One. So yeah, Chris, what's what do we got planned now for our interim between Act One and Two? We got some Avengers sized trivia for you, Anunth. So oh, we'll boy. go with 10 questions instead of the typical five that we do. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right. So the first one hopefully should be an easy one for you. Mm-hmm. So in the film, the six founding Avengers are Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, the Hulk, Black Widow, and Hawkeye. In the yes. comics, who are the five founding members? So, Iron Man, Hulk, Thor, Ant-Man, uh, the Wasp, and then who's the sixth one? No, there are only five. Oh, there's so, five, yeah, so there's the five, yeah. Correct. Yeah, yep. And there's, I guess, sort of an iconic comic book cover with them versus Loki in the first issue, so... Of course, um, you know, I guess the first movie's based on, you know, so. Yep. All right. One for one. Yep. Number two. Why does Captain America not eat shawarma in the post credit sequence? Oh, well, this one I know. This one is because he had a beard 
what I mean, one is they shot the shawarma post credit scene after the world premiere. So like right before the movie was going into theaters and he had a beard at that time. So in order to film it with, you know, a clean face, they had to put prosthetic makeup and mm-hmm. it still was like kind of rough. So they had him covering it with his, you know, fist and he was sort of looking away to the side. So he couldn't he couldn't move his mouth for that reason. That is correct. And this isn't a, this isn't like any sort of bonus points, but what movie was Chris Evans growing that beard out for? Uh, what movie was coming out of his at that time where that he had a beard? I don't even know a ton of Chris Evans movies outside I of... I feel like you said you've liked this movie. I could be wrong, but I think you said you've liked it. I like this movie. A Chris Evans movie. Oh my god. I, I, there's so few movies of his that I know outside of Marvel, which is kind of sad because I know he does good movies outside of this. Was it Snowpiercer? It is Snowpiercer. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. No, I do like Snowpiercer. You're right. I do like yeah. Snowpiercer. Great. So now off to a good start. Okay. So the third one is, you know, Tony mm-hmm. calls Loki, Thor, and Hawkeye each by a nickname. Yes. Name two out of the three nicknames. Okay. So Hawkeye, at the end of the movie, he calls Legolas, which Correct. makes sense, you know, Archer. And then... Thor, he says, no offense, but you have a mean swing point break. So he calls him point break. Correct. Are you able to guess all three? I mean, you got the what? point already, but. Yeah, but you said he called Cap a nickname as well? Loki. Loki a nickname. Oh. Reindeer Games. Oh, yeah, make a move, Reindeer Games. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, I did know that. All right. But it's well, okay. I got the point. Perfect so far. So which two Avengers share the same birthday? Oh, this I know from the from the the press events. This is mm-hmm. uh, Mark Ruffalo and Scarlett Johansson because they have like a running bit where they'll be like, "Oh, it's whatever September something." Is like, "No way, me too," and it's like a joke that they have. Correct. Yeah, they have that running bit where yeah, they basically pretend they don't know, and yeah. then they literally are saying every single word in sync with each other. Yeah. Exactly. Um, All right. In which countries is this movie titled Avengers Assembled? Or I guess Avengers Assemble. I'm pretty sure it's the UK and Europe because I remember reading about this because I was very curious why they called that. But I think it's because they have a TV show called The Avengers there and they didn't want to confuse it. So they called it Avengers Assemble instead of The Avengers. Sorry, you said the UK and where? UK and Europe. Well, Europe is n- not a country. Oh, I oh, I guess fair. I, it's a region. The UK, more... UK is correct. There is one other. One other country that this applies to? Oh, my God. Um, you are correct by the the TV series reason. I remember reading about it. Oh, God. What's, what's the other country? Is it France? It is not. We'll give you half a point. We'll give you half a point. It's the okay. UK and Ireland, which oh, well, that makes is, sense. Okay. Partially, you know, part of Ireland's part of the UK, part of it's not. We'll give you half yeah. a point. Okay, fine. Yeah, I should have probably guessed Ireland. That makes sense, but uh, yeah. So next question: Which okay. Avenger has the most screen time? Which Avenger has the most screen time? Well, it's definitely Tony or Cap, but now the question is, is which one of them has the most screen time? Uh, I'm probably going to say Cap, just on a hunch. Cap, that's my final answer. And that is correct. Yeah, let's go. This is this is going well so far. It's going very well for you. Uh-huh, yeah, Cap, yeah. Cap has... 37 minutes and 42 seconds of screen time. Iron Man is second most, so you were correct with your hunch of them being the top two. Yeah. Uh, at 37 minutes and one second. While oh, okay. Hawkeye has the least of That's 12 not minutes and 44 seconds. Yeah, I mean... Not expected. surprising, but you know. At the end of the day, Jeremy Renner still got his paycheck, so... That he did. Yep. You know, he played, he got his own TV series, too, so... You know, good yeah, he did get his own TV series, which I don't know if we want to talk about that in the highest terms, but, you know, he, he, he had I, one. I enjoyed it, but anyway. Which future comic book movie actor was on the shortlist 
for the role of Bruce Banner in this film? Future comic book actor of Bruce Banner. So they were considering someone other than Mark Ruffalo to play the role for Ed Norton left. Correct. This person was in the writing to take over as Bruce Banner, but ultimately, you know, Ruffalo got it. Huh. Future comic book actor. So that, I mean, that does narrow the pool a little bit. Probably not Cumberbatch. Probably not. I mean, I don't think anyone from DC was probably being considered. So that probably narrows them out. Or maybe, no, that not necessarily true. Maybe someone or another. God, I have no idea. I'm just going to guess here. Because mm-hmm. uh, I know that this he was up. Well, he was being considered for another role too. And in Marvel and didn't do it. So I'm going to say Joaquin Phoenix, because I know he was up for Doctor Strange, and it clearly seems like Marvel liked him. He was up for Doctor Strange, and you are correct. What a guess. Whoa, let's go. Yep. The future Joker actor was in the running for, or at least on the short list, for Bruce Banner, obviously, like we said. Wow. Uh, Didn't know he wanted him. I don't even know if he'd be a good Bruce Banner, though. He, I mean, Joaquin is a very idiosyncratic sort of guy so i can i can see a take you know where it's just somebody somebody with banner who's just could be mentally distraught i yeah, can see I that could, sort of take i could see that too um i don't know i just do not see him being in any franchise i think it's a miracle that he's even coming back for a sequel for jo- i think this joker 2 might be his first sequel ever if i remember correctly or if i'm if i'm right i don't know i, I, I think be it is surprised yeah like like yeah the reason or at least the rumored reason why he turned down uh, you know, Banner or Strange was because of the multi-movie nature of the contract. So, well, that's not surprising. I yeah. mean, yeah, he, he. I think he seems particularly averse to multi-movie contracts, which is fair. You know, big yep. commitment. Yep. All right. Next question. This is will be a multiple choice. The Avengers was the third highest-grossing movie of all time at the time of its release. Okay. What? Was its box office so a okay. nine hundred fifty million? Okay. B one point seven five billion. Okay. C one point five billion. Mm-hmm. And D one billion. One billion flat. Okay. So I know it was above a billion because I know this was the first MCU movie to make a billion dollars. One point seven five billion seems too high. Yeah, that seems way too high. So then it's between 1.5 and 1 billion flat. Even 1.5 seems on the higher side, but I don't think it made just a flat $1 billion. Okay, well, I mean, these are just, you know, rounding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, even like approximately 1.5 seems on the higher end. Um, But I think I'm going to go with that because I don't think it made just a billion. I think it made over like healthy amount over a billion dollars so i'm gonna say 1.5 that's my final answer and that is also correct let's go yeah how much did it make i forget off the top of my head but it was like 1.5 and change mm-hmm. i don't okay. want to do a, a quick search if you're that curious but yeah i'll, yeah. I'll look in the background guess if you want to ask your next question sure you're on a really hot streak right now a little, a little nervous when I have to catch up to you on these these scores, but anyway, um, yeah, one point five one nine billion dollars. Wow, I did not okay. think that it made that much money. Wow, you have little faith in one of your favorite movies. I mean, I thought it did well. I didn't know it that well. Like, I mean, to jump from you know the other movies like making, I don't think any of them other than Iron Man made like over five hundred million dollars. To jump from those. Like pretty paltry box office numbers to one point five is that is impressive. It's a good yeah. I mean, it's an it's a on literally an ensemble of several franchises into one. So yeah, yeah, makes, it, it makes it, sense. Yep, yeah, it was that's I'm I'm impressed. Color me impressed. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, question nine: What two MCU recasted characters appear in this film? So to clarify, they may not have been recasted yet at the time, or they may have. Recasted characters appear in this movie. 
Oh. There are two of them. What? There's two. I mean, I think one of them is the Hulk because he was recast. That is one. Yes. That's one. Yeah. So that makes sense. Who's the other one? Um, I mean, Hawkeye wasn't recast. I mean, obviously, none of the core Avengers were recast. Nick Fury what wasn't you, what recast. Do you mean? Yeah. Hulk other than recast. Hulk. Other than Hulk. Other than Hulk. No other core Avenger was recast. Coulson was not recast. Fury was obviously not recast. Maria Hill was not recast. Who else? Who else was recast in this movie? I mean, were they a main character? Like, were were they a, a, a like? Did they have prominent screen time in this movie? I think if I say that, it might uh, give it away. Not give it away, but definitely put you in prime position to to figure it out. Okay. Um. Because, I mean, I'm thinking of all of the main characters, like even name faces that we see in this movie, because Pepper wasn't recast, Selvig wasn't recast, um, Sit Jasper Sitwell wasn't recast, because I'm sure he popped up in another movie before this. I'm pretty sure he was in Thor 1. Yeah, who who was recast? I have no idea who was recast in this movie. They have oh. a point. Oh. No, oh, I think I know this one. It's, I think, I think it's the cop at the end of the movie. He gets recast in Agent Carter. Like that, yeah, it's the cop, dude. Well, that is, the character is not recasted. The actor is just recasted. The actor is recast, it's, yes. No, but the, the the question was, which MCU character recast? Which MCU character was recast? Oh my god, I don't know. I have no idea who this other MCU character was recast. Yeah, I'm gonna just take the half point on this because I have no clue. I'm sure I'm sure what oh, you, you tell will, me. Yeah, yeah, you will be like, "Wow, how did I not think of that?" It yeah. is Thanos. Oh, oh, that that's right. Yeah, this is the only movie that Josh Brolin doesn't. I didn't even think of Thanos. Correct. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll take the L on that one. I mean, you still got it partially right hit every question fully or partially correct. So it's still very, I, you know, I'm can't get too mad at that. And I kind of got like, you know, cause that one cop that shows up in agent Carter, but it wasn't yeah. a character. Correct. Yeah. Final question. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you will get this one. So mm -hmm. this might be Challenge the accepted. Yeah. It might, might be the first one that you don't actually get any points towards. Okay, let's see. So, during filming, which U.S. city was used as a double for Manhattan's 42nd Street, which is, you know, in front of Grand Central Station? Oh, I know this. Oh. I saw this. I was reading about this because, yeah, oh my god. Mm. Which U.S. city? I mean, I feel like the cop-out answer is Atlanta, or that's, that's like a safe guess, because I don't remember what the answer is to this one. Um, Atlanta, I mean, I feel like Pittsburgh is also a big one that they use for filming purposes. Chicago is also another one. So, I'm, I mean, it's one of those three, almost certainly. But I'm just going to go with Atlanta. That's that's my guess, because I feel like that's the safest bet. Wow. He finally does not get any points towards the question. Oh, that's... Nine sad. questions deep, but you stumped them. It that's is sad. the one and only Cleveland, Ohio. It was Cleveland. Wow. You know, who who would have thought that anything goes on in Cleveland? I mean, exactly. You know, sorry. Sorry, Ohioans. But didn't think much of, of Cleveland there. But hey, you know, nine out of ten. Pretty yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, it's that score with two half points and yeah, yeah. two half points. It's nine out of ten. Oh, two. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Nine out of you ten. You got the last okay. one. Yeah, zero. So, yeah. OK. OK. You know, I'll I'll take that. Very solid. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, that would be eight out of ten, I think, right? With two half points? Because that's seven questions right with two half points. Yeah, so that's eight out of ten. Uh, math is not mathing for me today. Yeah, eight out of ten, which, you know, I'm fine with an eight out of ten. That's, that's I think, a pretty good, you know, healthy passing score. That's a B. I mean, if, you, if you'll take a B, sure. I mean, I'll take, I'll, I'll take a B at this point, because... Can't, you know, refute it. I can't ask for a regrade here. <laughs>
But yeah, no, those are good questions though. Um, I almost got stumped on some of them, but yeah, those are good questions. Yeah. Cool. All right. I guess we can jump into act two. So act two now, where do we start off? So this is when Loki is brought into the helicarrier Mm -hmm. after he's been arrested and he's sort of taken through a tour of like kind of a tour of the helicarrier and he walks by the lab. And he kind of smiles when he yeah, passes by Banner. Banner. Yeah, yeah, because you know he's got something cooking with Banner there. And then he's put into the holding cell, which we later find out was designed for Bruce Banner. And Loki and Fury have a conversation. And I think what works here well for me is that Fury, you can tell he's particularly desperate. I mean, Loki says you must be really desperate to you know, try and assemble all of these people together. And Fury's like, yeah, you know, I am kind of desperate here. Yeah. Um, so I think that honesty and that vulnerability sort of works well because he's like deadly serious, but you can also tell he is really desperate here. But at the same time, at the flip side of it, you can tell that Loki feels like he is fully under control of this situation, which, I mean, Tom Hiddleston just sort of eats up every scene that he's in in this movie it's it's almost like it's unfair just how much fun he's having playing this role which i mean who wouldn't i mean playing loki just seems like such a blast but yeah i mean do you have any thoughts on i guess this opening bit where he's brought into the helicarrier um i agree with you like you can tell he is fully in control of the situation it plan is going swimmingly for loki yeah, it's a, like like kind of like Banner said, or somebody said, it's a little like you know creepy and and unnerving. Yeah. Um. And again, like I referred to before, I think it's Cap who is like that was a little too easy. It seems yeah. like you know he's the only one that wants to be on this what do they call it, a boat. Um. Yeah, I think Fury says that. Why do I feel like our prisoner is the oh, only yeah. one that wants to be here or something like okay, that? Okay. Yeah, it's Fury. Um. Yeah, I think it's a really good scene. I think. There's a very good back and forth between Fury and Loki, which you referenced. Uh, you know, the ant and boot, obviously unlimited power. That comes back Mace, from the beginning Mace of the Windu. movie. Rest in peace. <laughs> but yeah, I think, it's, I think it's really good. And then we sort of get our introduction to like finally the core Avengers, you know, except for Hawkeye, finally get to meet each other, you know, central part of the helicarrier yeah yeah when tony comes in i think what i like about when that when all of them meet and when tony walks into the helicarrier is you see like just tony immediately just takes charge because he has this sort of goofy irreverent nature about him but as soon as he gets in he like starts talking like serious like he knows what's up like he obviously did his homework as pepper asked him to do and at the same time also he's of sound mind enough to like plant a bug on the helicarrier so you can he yeah. you can always see he's like thinking like three steps ahead which i i mean yeah he i mean obviously robert just does such a good job playing this role in particular and part of that is of course he also strikes up an immediate kinship with dr banner and the first meeting of the science bros where they're you know going at it with the yeah. hardcore science terms there yes yes yeah and then of course we get one of the real iconic moments where fury makes a reference that cap actually understands and i know you and i use this line amongst one another is where we say i understood that reference yes and i think it's really sweet that cap like finally feels like he understands what's going on in like a modern conversation whereas like before he's just sort of like kind of going along as he can yeah i mean this this guy knows he's not in the right time period to like he's finally feels good for him to understand something in modern times yeah yeah i I think this scene in particular really typifies again the character interactions in this movie just work so well and they really put a lot of attention into it which is why i think we're all invested in them as a team and we really get and it's not a perfect team you can see that they're you know not working all together They're, they're, they're ticking time bomb yeah, you know, t- exactly. You know, in the words of Bruce, yeah, they're a ticking time bomb. But I think in that sense, like, you're almost rooting for them in a way because they're not so perfect right from the get-go, but you kind of do want to see them come together and be that sort of team that you know they can be. So I really like that. And I think another thing that I like in particular with is how they handle Banner. I remember reading this online was how 
the different characters all handle Banner in that they're all like sort of tiptoeing around him, and you can really yeah. see that they're trying to be like really cautious not to anger except, him. I mean, except him. for Tony. Except for Tony. Yeah, and you know, Tony, I think, is just fully accepting of Bruce, Hulk, and all. And yeah. he doesn't really fear it at all. He's more like sort of intellectually curious about it and like wants to learn more about it and i mean even in the lab he's like poking him and like trying to get him like a rise and he's like oh wow you really have this whole thing under control and obviously cap is terrified natasha is obviously like really oh, terrified really i mean she, yeah. <laughs> yeah she's really yeah. really scared of the hulk but i think that all like it's just really interesting how i think that's why bruce and tony also like i mean tony obviously takes interest in bruce but bruce also really is gravitated towards Tony because of that sort of, you know, brothership. They they speak on equal terms. It's not like Tony is like, you know, trying to condescend almost in any way or like trying to be a little bit more protective of Bruce in any manner. Like he he just treats him like, you know, you're just a dude and you have this thing about you, but who doesn't have, you know, their sort of skeletons or whatnot. So Yep. Yeah, yeah. But um, and not only that, but I think also the whole conversation that they have, all of the conversations that they have, you hear just like little bits and pieces, and they just seed all of the information that you need to know, really, in these really sort of clever ways that you don't really pick up on, I feel. And mm -hmm. I feel like I always pick up on something that they mention every now and then in the script when I rewatch the movie. And I feel like I've seen the Avengers so many times, but they talk about, you know, the gamma radiation in it, and they talk about you know how that comes back later in avengers endgame how all the stones are you know emitting gamma radiation and how hulk is the only one that can hold the gauntlet for example or even think about like the that scepter scene, yeah, yeah I, was, I was gonna say like even in that scene where like tony's like look that level of gamma should have killed you and then bruce is like you know are you saying you know other guy saved me and tony's like you know essentially said the line that um Hulk says Endgame's like, you know, I was made for this. Like Tony's basically saying, like, there's a reason why you didn't die from yeah. that gamma. And it yeah, like it comes back in Endgame. So like it's just another example. Yeah. I mean, not even like I guess bits and pieces that come back like in later movies, but like even bits that are earlier in this I mean, this is pretty early in Act Two, but <clears throat> the conversations that they have here, how they sort of pay off later on in the movie, I think, also mm -hmm just goes to show how this is such a great like tight script through and through and it feeds the information in a way to the audience where it's not like an exposition dump and it's not like sort of a dump of like oh this is the tesseract this is the information about the tesseract like you sort of get bits and pieces and the audience can pick up on it you sort of know what you need to know about what's going on so just i think you know they did a really good job overall with the writing and the script and of course the dialogue and the the way that it's all sort of acted out is also yes really good job there but yeah and i mean another it also like another bit about that script is how they keep talking about you know the tesseract being an energy source and energy source and bruce i think really made a good point about it is like why does fury keep mentioning the energy source bit and then says that like you know stark very publicly made like stark tower yeah. thing of clean energy he could have worked on it but you know there's trying to work on this tesseract and part and then, of that is, you know, they're trying to seed that, like, he's trying to be a little bit more pragmatic when he's trying to explain to Cap that, like, look, don't just take, you know, the government at face value. And I think, again, part of that is seeding that, you know, Cap, you shouldn't always be completely 100% trustful of the government like you were maybe back in the 40s. Like, you know, the, the government's up to shady stuff sometimes. And it sets up really well what goes on in Winter, Winter Soldier. Soldier. You know? I mean, very much Cap learns that he should not be trusting the government. And you can really yeah. see all of those arcs starting to play out for the characters, which I think is just, you know, they did a really good job. Whether intentional or not, they, they really sort of continued their stories quite well, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, even so, like, to build on the Winter Soldier part, like, you know, Cap goes on to investigate himself and literally finds Hydra, or at least old Hydra gear and weapons within the helicarrier so it you know a little bit of foreshadowing like you said not sure if they intended that or not but hydra being hidden within shield yeah yeah so, exactly yeah exactly yeah i mean and then of course i think the big thing about act two is that everyone sort of gets their little crack at loki where you know fury got his crack at loki and then natasha i think the big thing is, is that natasha get or thor gets a little bit of a 
time to talk with Loki. And then Natasha gets her chance now to talk with Loki as well. And and again, I think we get this like cool little interrogation scene and you get that more was great, of a sense yeah. of Natasha being this really sort of clever interrogator. She gets she really does put herself in a vulnerable or seemingly vulnerable position to try and get Loki to open up. And then she gets to find out exactly what Loki's plan is. And then at the same time, we also get a little bit of Natasha's backstory, which I didn't even realize until I saw this movie just like for this episode that it actually ties into the Black Widow movie because Loki mentioned yeah, Drakov's, Drakov's daughter, daughter. Yep. which was, I didn't even realize they mentioned it in this movie. It was just a complete throwaway line, which is, I guess, cool they brought it back. So, yeah, I thought that it was also a really cool little interrogation scene. Also, Great, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, no. Just, I just wanted to add, like, yeah, I thought it was, like, you, I agree with all your points, and it was a really like you said, very clever of uh, Natasha sort of feigning, uh, being, you know, emotionally attacked. And this is like the first time where we see like Loki, his plan does not go the way he thinks. Yeah. This is the first time where that happens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think another part of that, which I thought was interesting, was that Loki, I think rightfully points out that like, look, everyone is doing some shady stuff here. Like, you know, Tony is launching that and i like how they sort of cut to it as well where they show that the virus is discovered and tony is looking at Mm -hmm. that virus and then how the shield was hiding those hydro weapons in order to prep phase two so like everyone is doing like everyone sort of has their own ulterior motives it's not like everyone is here out of like the pure intentions that they all claim to be of course they're all looking to keep an eye on banner as well as you know trying to I guess almost take advantage of him in a way just because he knows about gamma radiation as much as he does. Yeah. I mean, do you have anything to add, I guess, on the Loki interrogation? No, no. I think we're good to you know, talk more about this act. Yeah. So, of course, all of that, you know, comes to a head with the whole conversation that they have in the lab. And they're, everyone really has this sort of conflict amongst one another. Mm-hmm. And everyone is really arguing about it where. Cap finds out about what phase two is and Tony, it gets a little bit of scolding from Cap for trying to prod uh, Banner and Fury also comes in as well. And Natasha's also there as well to try and like calm down Hulk because she realizes that that's the plan. So what what did you think about this scene in particular? Because I I mean, this I think for me is like sort of the core bit of act two, which I found really fascinating. And I think this is maybe one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I I think it's a fantastic scene. It's really showing the Avengers disassembling, you know, Mm -hmm. just internally. Like, like we said, this is not a group of people who really should be together or mix well together. And it's, this is a very prime example of that where they all have like their own little issues with each and every other member, essentially of the team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there definitely is that implication that the Mind Stone is influencing this sort of behavior as, you know, everybody's arguing. The camera kind of just sort of slowly pans and zooms into the Mind Stone, which again mm-hmm. is, is kind of cool. And I guess in Age of Ultron, they, they kind of reference how the stone is kind of has a mind of its own or is kind of sentient or thinking. But yeah, like 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 I said, it's a really great scene to show these people don't really belong together and are here for whatever reasons and you know it's not gonna lead to good things <laughs> mm-hmm. as we've seen very shortly yeah no absolutely i like the point you made on the mind stone because i also noticed this as well because like when they're doing all of that arguing they actually shoot it in a way where like they they're upside down and the yeah. scepter with the mind stone is above them and I thought that was interesting symbolism into how, you know, it very much shows that Loki is the one that's sort of over everyone at this point, And he's still very much in control of the situation and everything is really playing out how he wants it to with the sort of discord that's going on amongst the team. So I really like that. And part of it, I think it also the goal of the scene is to really break down the characters and again really invests us in each of them because all of the interactions are so realistic and everyone is bringing up like fair decent points amongst one another like you know cap is 
rightfully scared that Tony is trying to prod Hulk or try to prod Banner. And Cap is also rightfully mad at Fury about the whole phase two thing. And so is Tony about like phase two being and the Tesseract being used for weapons and stuff. And so is Banner. Banner's also upset about it. And Natasha also just being there trying to calm everything down as well. So Mm -hmm. like all of those interactions, I think just really, they all make sense for the characters. They make sense for the scene in the movie. And again, it really sort of invests unrest and sort of the divide between all of them at this point is that really makes us want to see them all come together by the end, which of course they do, but Mm -hmm. it's uh, in, even when they come together at the end, it's almost, there's almost a bit of hesitation when they do come together. It's sort of like, you know, we got to put aside a little bit of our differences and have to come together Mm -hmm. now. But uh, I think it thought the scene was awesome. Of course, this is really the scene that, I mean, this is the scene where he banner mentions that they are a time bomb and yes, the scene really does show it. And then when another bit also, of course, is Tony and Cap's back and forth that's, about like, you know, put on the suit. That's exactly what I was about to say, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, go on about that scene. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like we were mentioning, they plant a lot of seeds in this act of, or even like literally this room mm-hmm. um, of like things that go on as like future storylines or plot lines in the different franchises. And obviously this one would be civil war, but yeah, uh, you know, everything special about you Rogers came out of a bottle. The Steve at heart, what's special about him is his, his character, like um, his ideals. Whereas, you know, was it cap is like, you know, put on a suit of armor, you know, you know, you're always never, you're like, you know, never the guy to put, you know, essentially like your life on the line and, yeah, you're always trying trying to figure out shortcuts, essentially, and you know, mm-hmm. Tony ends up making literally his own life sacrifice to save the universe, you know, in Endgame. So it's yeah. really cool how kind of all those come full circle later on yeah, in the MCU. Yeah. I mean, even in this movie, he sacrifices his own life almost. I mean, he almost yeah. doesn't make it through the portal, which yeah. we kind of did do see in What If that what happens if he didn't make it through the portal at the end. But in this movie, he almost didn't make it through the portal either. Like he he takes a nuke, throws it into space, and uh, yeah, really does. I mean, the whole conversation in to- with between Tony and Cap, I think, definitely is the most interesting, which is why, and rightfully so, I think they picked up on this being the most interesting bit and how it sort of leads into Civil War and their sort of whole different perspectives on everything really makes mm-hmm. this movie, makes the relationship just so interesting. So, yeah. And one other bit from this conversation, which I have to mention that I really liked, which we don't really get this sort of darkness from, I think, Marvel movies really anymore, for the most part, is the whole conversation where Banner talks about how he tried to kill himself, almost. I mean, I guess trigger warning yeah. for anyone that yeah. is... It's dark, man. I mean, he's talking about how he was like at a really low point and just wanted to, you know, end everything. And he couldn't. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So Poor guy. it's just... Yeah. Just, I mean, it's really, really fascinating. The whole conversation, that whole scene is just, I really love that whole scene. Yeah, it's it's a great scene. Yeah. Of course, you know, all of it is broken apart then when, uh, you know, Hawkeye is outside doing some other things. It sort of takes some time. It's almost stalling in a way for Hawkeye because then Hawkeye comes in and then busts one of the rotors of the helicarrier and everyone is sort of spurred into action again. And Mm -hmm. I think maybe the most interesting bit of this scene, of course, is, I mean, Tony and Cap obviously work together here, but I think the more interesting scene is that this is the first time that we get to see the Hulk Hulk out. So what are your thoughts on, I guess, the whole thing with Hulk where he's chasing Natasha and then he fights with Thor and then he jumps off? Yeah, thoughts on on the Hulk here. I really love this. Yeah. Like, we... We really get to see... Um, why people are so afraid of the Hulk? Like, obviously, you know, if you watch the Incredible Hulk, it's, it's obviously a different version in the sense that it's mm-hmm, played by mm-hmm. a different actor with a different take on him. But if you hadn't seen that, which again, it wasn't really critical to see that movie before the Avengers, you really get to see why people are afraid of this dude. And also, like the the transformation from Banner to Hulk is much different than the, the Norton version of. Um, the transformation for sure um, but yeah like you see why natasha is so afraid i mean she literally gets chased down and you can see how powerful like the hulk is and being yeah. able to 
one v one with with Thor, which obviously comes back later. Surprise, mm-hmm. surprise! In you know Thor Ragnarok. Yep. Um, but just the way the Hulk looks though is just so good. Like the CGI is so good. Yeah. The, the Hulk. Oh yeah. I mean, I would argue that Hulk's VFX have never looked better in any movie than it has in the Avengers through and through. I agree. Yeah. It's just so, so good. It's, I mean, the whole, everything with the Hulk in this is so great. Yeah. I mean, I can't speak enough about how much I love the Hulk in this, this movie in particular. It's just really great. Of course, do you have anything else, I guess, to add about the whole Hulk, I guess, interaction that he had with (laughs) Natasha and Thor? Uh, No, I mean, it's just a very solid fight. It really, again, like I said, really instills fear uh, into people about like how much damage and this being can do and why people are so afraid of why banner is so afraid of it of the hulk Uh, and then obviously you know hulk attacks the uh the fighter jet and (laughs) gets launched into somewhere (laughs) and it's just yeeted out (laughs) of there yeah no i mean remember in the theater when I saw it is when the fighter pilot tries to eject and then the Hulk grabs, grabs the seat him. and then throws him. Oh my, everyone's like, Oh man. Like I could hear a visible gasp from everyone or an audible gasp. Sorry. When everyone said that it was just, Oh, it was great. Just such a great scene. And I mean, of course, simultaneously Loki is about to escape Thor gets trapped and thrown off. And at the same time, I think the other, I think big thing in this whole bit is that Coulson comes out with a destroyer gun. And mm-hmm. I remember this bit also got a ton of cheers where he has the destroyer gun and he says, step away, please. But of course, it's short-lived because he gets killed right after. And again, I think it really speaks to how well Coulson was developed in this movie in particular, that everyone mm-hmm. was like really broken up about Coulson being killed. And I think that really speaks to how they wrote him in this movie. And of course, Clark Gregg did such a good job with the role yes. yep. in this movie. So. Just all around, I mean, obviously very sad that Coulson died, but I think Fury rightly realizes that he is the sort of catalyst that is going to bring them all together. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on, I guess, Coulson's death there? I mean, I guess there's not much more to be said. Yeah, there's not much more to be said. Like, I mean, he does get to shoot Loki <laughs> with the destroy gun, but yeah, it's like he he's just a side character who is very dry. In mm-hmm. terms of the way he talks and everything, but yet, like you said, they develop him very well. Where audiences feel upset that this character is killed, even though he's very much not a main focal point at all, and yeah. very much your standard like sort of secret agent. But mm-hmm. it's just so nuanced the way that he's portrayed by Clark Gregg and the way he's written. That yeah, people have this sort of reaction and sad that yeah. he died. Yeah, I mean, he was almost a stand-in for the audience member, I feel. Like, especially, like, how he was getting excited about the about Cap when he first met Cap. Yeah. Where he's, like, talking about the destroyer gun. He's like, even I don't know what it does. Which, like, kind of, I mean, the audience doesn't know what it does either. Uh, yeah, so I think in that sense, like, they really built a solid connection between Coulson and the audience. So, it's, yeah. I mean, just was definitely really sad that he he is killed in this movie. Or so we thought, because then, you know, we get Agents Tahiti. of S.H.I.E.L.D. and get, what, seven <laughs> to eight seasons of that, where apparently yeah. he didn't die. But that's fuzzy canon. I don't know if we count yeah. that as real. Um, yeah, I think the last major bits of this whole bit of Act 2 are that Clint and Natasha reconnect. They have their little fight. Do you have any thoughts on that fight? No, not really. I mean, you could tell Natasha's really trying to pull her punches, and then at some point she's yeah. like, you know, through this, like... Let me let me see if I can, you know, get this guy back to normal. And then I think when she hits his head the first time and he kind of snaps out of it a little bit, she's like, okay, head trauma. That's how we do bonk. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, bonk. And then, uh, yeah, you know, it's a good little fight between two friends. And then, uh, yeah, Natasha breaks him free of Loki's mind control. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, um, I, I like how she called it cognitive reconditioning, you know, hitting him in the head. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, of course, the final bit is, you know, Tony realizes that Loki wants to, you know, use the Tesseract in the most public way possible to try and get people to kneel before him and all. Realize it's going to be in New York, and they quickly go out, of course, do find Loki in New York. And the final bit of Act 2 is Iron Man and Loki's interaction. 
And part of it is, you know, Tony stalling to set up time for his Mark Seven suit to set up. But it's also a really great character moment between him and Loki because he hasn't really had his moment with Loki yet. I think he's he and Cap are really the only two left. I don't think Cap actually ever really gets a moment with Loki in particular. But yeah, what do you think of this, I guess, final conversation that Tony and Loki have? Uh, I liked it. Huh. Like you said, very good sort of like one-to-one interpersonal sort of dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we get the great meme of not a great plan uh, yeah. from it. Um, but and also, you know, well, we have a Hulk. Uh, yeah. But, and obviously, and also, I guess a lot goes on there in this, but also like, you know, Earth's Mightiest Heroes and mm-hmm. Loki's like, you know, kind of confused, you know. So obviously the classic comics Avengers tagline. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, like you said, some good conversation and you know tony also saying to like loki like look even if you know you win even if your army comes you know it's all on you to Mm -hmm. actually execute and you know there's no no version of this where you sit on a throne again later comes back in the loki series and he gets his throne and whatever yeah yeah they definitely did not intend for that but it's just a very good conversation between you know, Tony and, and Loki, especially like you said, Tony's just trying to stall. And it's a pretty good dialogue for stalling, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think the also the thing about all of it being on Loki is that Loki, I mean, he said he single man, single handedly managed to piss off every single Avenger. So every Avenger has a personal grudge with Loki in particular. I mean, he pissed. He almost got Natasha to quote unquote cry. Probably not really. He brainwashed Clint. He unleashed the Hulk. He, I mean, he pissed off Tony, of course, by using his tower. And then Cap, you know, he basically did piss off every single one of them. So yeah, I mean, it's a great conversation. And then of course, when he gets thrown off, I remember the whole suit up scene in the air with Iron Man. Also That's got cool. such a big, big fist pump cheer moment in the theater as well. And I mean, this this is really the first of the rest of Act 3 is just like full of like head bumping, cheering, like just such great moments throughout all of Act 3. Because Act 3 is really where everyone has sort of been just sort of like waiting for because everyone knows that the Battle of New York is just going to be like incredible. Uh-huh. So, yeah, I guess any final thoughts on Act 2? Because that's that's I guess really it. Yeah, I think like you alluded to earlier, it's this is where it really kind of gets going, where the meat is, you know, really at. Like we kind of alluded to, there are some pretty good comedic moments that happen in this act, whether mm-hmm. it's uh, like, you know, when did you become an expert in like thermonuclear astrophysics? And I was like, yeah, site. or like, you know, like we said, the cap game that under- I understood that reference to the flying monkeys or like, hey, you know, them trash talking Loki and Thor is like, yeah. you know, he's he's my brother and Natasha be like, well, he killed X amount of people. And then Thor's like, he's adopted you know kind yeah. of just like the small comedic moments like really pop up during yeah yeah this uh, this act and i really you know thought it was very well placed no for sure because i think it's interesting because i mean jo- definitely joss whedon's you know style and tone where he sort of peppers in the humor here and there and i mean it works i think it, this is the movie that it works the best in out of the movie i guess the recent movies that he's directed because obviously he has avengers 2 which it also does work for the most part in that and then I mean, a good chunk of Justice League, uh, I guess the theatrical version of Justice League, where I don't think it really works at all. But I think in this movie in particular, it works really, really well, for sure. Um, yeah. And another, I guess, bit that comes up in Act 2 is that man is playing Galaga. We thought we would, wouldn't we wouldn't notice, but we did. Um, and then, of course, they do show him cutting back to playing Galaga. So just really great sort of little comedic moments. But Act two is really focused on developing the relationship between the Avengers and interactions between them and the characters overall, which is why I really like act two, despite the, you know, criticisms that it is boring, which I understand, but for me, it wasn't, but yeah, I guess that's act two, unless you have any other final thoughts, Chris. No, uh, I said all my final thoughts for this act. Cool. All right. So, you know, between act two and three, you know, we're, we're already running a little bit over time. But I did have something different slightly planned for you here. So what I'm going to have you do is for all of, I guess, the Infinity Saga, this might be a bit tough, but 
I'm going to give you 20 seconds to name every villain. And oh, God. For, yeah, I'm going to give you 20 seconds to name every villain. I don't know how I'm going to score this. I guess I'll figure it out. But maybe I'll give you half a point for each one, because I think there's 22 movies. So then that gives you roughly 10 points or so. So I'm not going to give you too much time to think about this. So I'm just going to say, ready, go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, want to give me a countdown, though? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, I'll give you a countdown. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, five, four, three, two, one, go. Okay, Iron Monger, <laughs> Abomination, Whiplash, mm -hmm. Loki, yeah. times two, uh, yeah. Red Skull, yeah. uh, Killian, yes. uh, Malekith, yeah. Whew, I'm just going in order. Ronin, yeah. Thanos, Ultron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The high evolutionary. That's not that's not the first saga, but your time is up. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, your time is up. You got twelve total people, so that right. I'll give you six points I'll take for that. Six. six points. That was that was, that was pretty good. I know. I, um, you I should have said the Winter Soldier. Oh my god. Yeah. Winter Soldier. I mean, you live a lot. The title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, Winter Soldier. I mean, you got Malekith before the Winter Soldier, so. Well, I mean, you know. yeah, I was going in order, and then I was yeah. like, yeah, screw this. <laughs> that, yeah, no, no. I mean, but I would have probably done the same thing. But yeah, Winter Soldier was a good one. Of course, also, Alexander Pierce could arguably be another yeah. villain in that movie. But anyway, yeah, you did a good job. I'd say six points. That's that's pretty solid uh, score there. So, yeah, that's, I guess, our little in-between here, between Act 2 and 3. I guess we're not doing the Stan Lee cameo yet, because Stan Lee cameos right at the end of the movie, so we'll talk about it then. But, yeah, I guess we'll jump right into Act 3. But, honestly, I mean, there's not really, like, I guess, bits to talk about in Act 3, because it basically is just the Battle of New York, which is, I mean, glorious and incredible, in my opinion. I'm sure you feel the same way, Chris. And it's mm -hmm. just about 30 minutes of pure action as soon as the wormhole opens. So, I mean, I guess we'll just talk about it in its entirety. What did you think about the third act of this movie? Because I think it's just, I mean, it's just pure, just perfection in my mind, honestly. I think, again, overall, this movie is so solid. I think it's a very solid third act. We finally get to see the Avengers assemble on their own terms. <laughs> Obviously, we get that that uh, kind of like circular shot or the rotating shot right yeah, in front the of the iconic shot. Yes. Yeah. Of this the the original six. <laughs> it was really yeah, I think it's just really cool to see, especially like the tracking shots, but really just cool to see them all fight just like an alien army and you know, see Cap really take the lead of, you know, being the only one in 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 the army, being able yep. to actually like lead and direct, okay, you guys go here, you guys go here. And you can really see, like, they follow because um, they understand this guy is tactical. He knows what he's doing. So it's yeah. really kind of cool to see all of them kind of fill their roles within the Avengers for the first time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it's super cool. Just, just there's so many great moments in this whole thing. I mean, you mentioned the 360 shot, which is iconic. The, the Warner, the sort of the tracking shot of all six of them sort of working in their own little bits of New York doing their thing was also mm -hmm. great. Of course, they try and recreate that in Avengers 2. And then, I mean, even within the fight, you get little bits where each of the characters interact with one another, which is really great. Like, you get Clint and Natasha interacting, like, this is just, like, Budapest all over again. And then Hulk and Loki interact, where Hulk, you know, does his rag iconic doll. sort of... The ragdoll, yeah. I mean, that's also incredible. Cap has his little moments with Iron Man as well, where they're like, you know... He uses the shield to sort of deflect the repulsor beams and stuff. I, I mean, everyone just has their little bits together. And again, the the divides between them in Act 2 makes us all just sort of really relish how they've come together in Act 3 in particular. And really, again, just a lot of fist-pumping, cheering moments. I mean, I, I just remember, it was almost hard to hear what was going on in the movie, I remember, in the theater, just because everyone was just sort of cheering, I think, almost at everything. It was just incredible. It was... I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that in the theater, except for maybe in Avengers Endgame. But I was gonna say Endgame, probably. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Endgame also was probably like that. So I guess to make it 
just to simplify our discussion of Act 3, maybe what are three moments in Act 3 for you that really stood out or that you just are like sort of etched in your mind? Well, definitely the Hulk literally just tossing Loki back and forth. Oh, of course. Um, That was just really funny. I'm a god, um, you dull creature. Yeah, puny god. So there's that. Yeah. Um, probably the the nuke scene where Tony, like we said, flies it up into the portal, right. lets it go, hits the Chitauri mothership, and kind of like goes unconscious as he's falling down and with the Hulk going to jump and save him and mm-hmm. basically mm-hmm. reviving him. So that's yeah. probably a second one. I'm trying to see the third the third one. I don't know, probably the, the, that's, you know, when Hulk, Hulk, or Banner Hulk's out, when, you know, he, they arrive together, you know, right in front of Grand Central's, you know. Yeah. That's my secret cap, I'm always angry. That, him transforming on oh. command to, you know, punch that, was it, like a Leviathan? The Leviathan, yeah. Yeah. So those are probably the three for me, what about you? I mean, I think you stole mine with the Hulk one. I mean, the Leviathan scene was just, inc- I mean, oh, I was cheering so hard when that happened when Hulk punches the Leviathan. But I think for me, the one scene that stuck out to me was the, I mean, even when Thor and Loki are fighting again, the focus on character where he's like, you can still end this. Like he, even though he realizes that Loki is probably too far into this, he's like, just forget this and still just come home with me. And Loki is like, nah, man. And then he stabs (laughs) Thor even then. Uh, I mean, even in, even in all of the madness, like the fact that they take the time to sort of still focus on those little character interactions, I, I, I remember that particularly well. And then on the flip side, another Thor moment is when after Hulk and Thor crash the Leviathan into Grand Central, Hulk punching Thor, sort of a sort of payback to him for that fight in the Helicarrier, I thought was kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then what's a third one? Um, I would say maybe a third one is the... What would be a third one? I think it's just the, I think it's also, again, the whole bit about Cap trying to take control and take command. And he ch- tries to tell the cops like what to do. And the cops like, yeah, well, I mean, Why I'm sorry. But, you know, yeah. Who, who, who the hell are you? Why would I listen to you? And then he just sort of like fights the Chitari and then the cops like, oh, okay. And then he starts doing whatever he asked him to do. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess some humorous moments, I think you took some of the ones that I wanted to use, but, um, I mean, again, I think this fight, I think what makes Act 3 so great is, obviously, the action's incredible. The CG is flawless. Like, I don't think there's anything that makes you realize that, like, these are, like, computer-generated graphics. Of course, the Leviathan stuff are obviously not real, but it's all so well done. They have those character moments in there, and also sort of comedic bits as well. And it's all just paced really, really well. Like, it's all just interspersed, just at the perfect time. Like when you need a little bit of a laugh and a break, you get that break. When you need a little bit of like more serious moment, you get it. And I think it all just sort of works really well together in this act. Mm -hmm. And then even the ending of the movie, I think ends also really well where you sort of get this little, like the slow little retrospective at the end. Like, you know, what are you going to do now? Like, they're like, Oh, oh." Nick Fury's like, you know, I don't care. They, they've deserved a little bit of time off. They, they save the world. But Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what do you think of how, I guess, this movie ends, apart from, you know, the whole Battle of New York? Yeah, I think uh, I think you put it well. I They kind of have their own, they go their own separate ways. I think it's really, really good. You know, science bros go off together. Um, you know, you see Clint yeah. and Tasha. And then, you know, you have Cap going on like his, his motorcycle. So I think it's, it's a really nice send-off. And, you know, like you said... Fury's telling the World Security Council, like, yeah, they deserve some time off. Like, they saved the world, and yeah, you know, when it's time to come back together, they'll do it. So I, yeah. I think it's really good, and basically, yeah, it's like a mic drop moment for Fury, and he yeah, kind of then for just sure. walks out. For so sure, for I, sure. I think it was good, and then um, yeah, it's a good ending, and then obviously we get you know the post credits afterwards. But yeah, yeah, we can talk about the post credits, of course. I did also want to mention that. We also get, I mean, we also see like the news about what's going on yeah. after the attack. And I like how we also got to see like a little bit about like how real people, yeah, thought, what to real this, people yeah. thought about it. Obviously, I think it was a little bit more positive where like we saw some kids reacting to it and we saw the waitress 
played by Ashley Johnson, where it's like, oh, Captain America saved my life and all of that stuff. And then I think the really sort of only naysayer is the Stan Lee cameo, of course, where he's like, superheroes in New York, give me a break. But yeah, great ending. But yeah, I guess we can just sort of jump into the post credit scenes. Of course, <clears throat> the big one is the reveal of Thanos, which I guess, what are your thoughts on that? Pretty wild. Obviously, one of the bigger post credit scenes in the entire MCU, given that this is the puppet master behind an entire saga of three phases. Of course. Uh, you know, Thanos really didn't have much here, but to really just have a headshot of him turn and smile. But the yep. fact that they uh, they put that in there was like, man, this guy was behind Loki. Yeah. Um, I think it was pretty cool. And to see like the other, like, you know, who his master is, um, you finally kind of put like a, you know, you get a face to to that, not even a name, like they don't even say Thanos, but, you know, yep. comic fans knew who who he was when they saw him. Uh, I was a little interested about, you know, the reveal of Thanos, sure, but then we find out that you know, Thanos' goal, well, I guess if you knew the comics, you, you knew he likes to collect these Infinity Gems or Infinity Stones, what they call them in the MCU. Mm -hmm. That you would willingly just lend one to Loki, um, knowing that it was you know the Mind Stone, and then you know, in order yeah. to to capture the Space Stone in the Tesseract, and then at the end of the movie, Thanos now has zero when he started off with one. So yeah, I don't really understand that logic, like, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, I guess to that point, also Thanos. I mean. Definitely was not planned that Thanos is going to be sort of the overall big bad for the entire saga. Well, as far as I've read, Joss Whedon just put him in there at the end because he thought it would be cool. Yeah, yeah so, that's what I read too. Yeah, so I don't think it. I don't think that there was really sort of any, I guess, thought to you know him giving away an Infinity Stone initially. So that was, I think, interesting. But yeah, I'm going to shamefully admit here. When I think I saw it for the first time, I thought that it was Super Scroll that they were revealing, not Thanos. I didn't know who Thanos was at the time. Obviously, I'm a wiser man now, but uh, yeah, I thought that was, I mean, obviously after reading when I came out of the theater who Thanos was, I was like, oh, this is actually way more important than it being Super Scroll. But, yes, um, very much. Yeah, and of course, they didn't have the rights to Super Scroll, but just, yeah, uh, yeah really, obviously, one of the most important post credit scenes in the MCU. And then, of course, the second one we we already talked yeah. about, sort of with the trivia shawarma. scene, is the yeah. shawarma, which is also just an iconic post credit scene, just great. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun, lighthearted, like, you know, a nothing but same time, just like iconic scene. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much it. Do you have, I guess, any final thoughts on the the whole movie here, Chris? I mean, we could talk about the cameo real quick and then get into it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I guess, how do what do you think of the Stanley cameo? How does this rank amongst the other ones that we've seen? It's probably towards the middle or lower, honestly. Um, mm. You know, it's just you know him on the news broadcast saying like, "Super Zero New York," like whatever. Yeah. You know, like I don't know. It's just it's whatever for me. You might feel differently, but to me, it was just like really just whatever. So where would you <laughs> rank it in between? I don't remember my current rankings at the moment, but uh, I would say it's it's on the lower end. On the lower end, okay. I'm not, I like it better than the Incredible Hulk. I think the Hulk is like the bottom for me at the moment. But yeah. um, so I can tell you that. your ranking if that helps. Sure. Yeah. So right now you have it ranked as Iron Man one, Iron Man two, Cap one, Thor, and Incredible Hulk. Yeah, I put it. Between Thor and Incredible Hulk. Thor and Incredible Hulk. Okay, okay. So that's towards the bottom, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think for me, I like this one. I like it maybe more than his cameo as Larry David. And I like it more than his cameo in The Hulk as well, where he drinks the, the soda and hulks out or whatever, has gamma poisoning. So I'd probably put it between Iron Man 1 and Iron Man 2. So I guess for context, my... Ranking here is Thor, Cap 1, Iron Man 1, now the Avengers, Iron Man 2, and Incredible Hulk. Got it. Yep. But yeah, that's, I guess, our rankings. But 
Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that would be interesting also is just sort of, I think, talk about phase one now as a whole, now that we are basically done with phase one. So, I mean, Chris, yeah, what are your thoughts on, I guess, how phase one turned out overall? Of course, I think for me, started off very strong with Iron Man, a little bit of bumps here and there in the middle, but I think solid introductions to all of the core heroes for the most part. And then, of course, mm-hmm. ends with a bang with the Avengers. But, I mean, obviously, it was set up well enough that it set a great foundation for the next yeah. two phases of MCU films. So, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, like you said, solid intro Iron Man 1, solid closing with the Avengers. Little bumps in between. The real only The only real hiccup was Incredible Hulk. I thought Cap one and Thor are fine. Yeah. Um, you know, so overall, I think a pretty, at least a good phase. Um, not the best one, but definitely mm-hmm. not the worst one. I think we know what the worst one is at the current moment. Yeah. But um, I think a solid intro to the MCU. Yeah, yeah, definitely a solid intro to the MCU for sure. Um, and I guess, I guess we didn't actually even give the Avengers a rating. But how would you yeah, rate time. this movie? out of I, our normal scale i would probably give it a 4.5 4.5 that's i think very solid yeah um you know i think interesting because i think it back in the day when it came out i would have probably given this a solid five i think now having seen the later on mcu movies i would probably also give it a 4.5 i think that's a very solid rating i mean mm-hmm. what what's holding back that point five for you chris Again, it's beginning was still a little slow for me. Yeah, no, that's fair. But that's not the only thing. But uh, I don't know. It's just the other MCU films where I'm like, man, this movie was really blown me away and it exceeded way beyond my expectations. Where event, I don't know, the first Avengers was like. I knew it was going to be a big movie and it hit those marks. Mm-hmm. Things like Endgame where there was just, or even Infinity War, where there were things that I was not even expecting to happen. And, you know, I had lofty expectations and they still happened. And, you know, and some, that's when I kind of would give it that extra point. Yeah, I mean, I think that's solid. I think that's that's very fair reasoning. Um, I, I mean, I think for me, it definitely exceeded the expectations that I had coming into this movie. I didn't know what to expect. I, I mean, I thought it was going to be good especially the reviews being as good as they were. I remember watching a lot of non-spoiler reviews of this movie before going into it. And I think even then it sort of surpassed all of my expectations for how enjoyable and fun the experience was. I think part of that was obviously also the movie going experience, seeing it in full theater with everyone fully invested in this movie on opening night. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, I think it, it just gets the half off for me just because I think that, Infinity War and Endgame are just better Avengers movies. They are. A slight bit. I mean, they're they're just such good movies, those two. Yeah. So, and it's not a knock on this movie at all. I think just because those are better, that this one just seems a little bit less by comparison. But that's Mm -hmm. not, no slight at all at this movie. This movie is just so much fun. I really had a great time rewatching it for sure. But yeah, I mean, I guess any final thoughts here before we wrap up? I think we've run... Pretty well over time here, Chris. Yeah. No, yeah, no, no additional thoughts. I think we covered some, some ground to say the least. Yeah, yeah, we definitely did. But I think you know, great wrap up to phase one. Of course, we'll be back in the new year in 2024 with Iron Man three, uh, start of phase two, and yeah, I mean, hopefully you're looking forward to it, Chris. I know I haven't seen Iron Man three. I think since it came out. Well, we. We just missed it for the holiday season because it is a Christmas movie, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it is a Christmas movie. You know, Shane Black does love a Christmas movie, but yeah, I am looking forward to rewatching that again because I think that that one, it's an intro, that's a complicated movie. That's really interesting, that one. Yeah, but uh, yeah, of course, just our usual wrap up bits here, of course. If you like this episode or any of our prior episodes, please be sure to like them on your podcasting platform of choice. Of course, we are available on Spotify, Google, Amazon Podcast, wherever you get your podcast, really. And if you have any questions or thoughts or opinions that you'd like to 
forward to us, please do so at our email address, which is ostrichtechnique at gmail.com. You know, if you have, yeah, but I think for uh, myself and for Chris, thanks for listening to us past, you know, a couple of, you know, past half year or so as we've started on this podcast. And here's to a great 2024. We hope you all have a great new year and hope you all had a great holiday season. And uh, no, that's it for me. So we'll catch you guys next time. So thanks guys. Bye.